Okay, today on the show, we have Lance Kirshner from the Lake Group at Compass. Now, backed by more than 16 years of experience, Lance is an award-winning Chicago real estate expert specializing in concierge-level service that makes every transaction seamless and successful. He is the founder and leader of the Lake Group at Compass, which is a dynamic team that embraces his mission of superlative service, market knowledge, and creative collaboration. Um, real estate has been a lifelong passion for Lance. He acquired his license while earning his bachelor's degree in entrepreneurship from the uh, University of Illinois. Lance is also a certified uh, residential appraiser, which gives his clients a distinct advantage when pricing their property. Lance and his team believe in fostering meaningful relationships that last as clients' needs evolve. This people-centric approach has placed the group among the top 1% of Chicago realtors. Lance has closed nearly 200 million in transactions over his career, and he was honored to receive the 2019 Industry MVP Award from Chicago Agent Magazine. Uh, Lance resides in, here in Chicago in Roscoe Village with his wife, Amanda, and their two golden doodles. Uh, Lance, welcome to the show. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, before Lance, please find Lance online at Lance K, that's L-A-N-C-E-K.com, and on Instagram, which is at Broker Lance. Lance, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. I'm uh, definitely excited to be here. Yeah, we are too. You were at the very top of our list when we first started uh, this four years ago. And so we're so we know how busy you are. So we appreciate uh, you finding the time to do this. It's a big thrill for us. Um, and, be, you know, you've been a broker for, for gosh, uh, 16 plus years. Uh, you've seen um, some ups and downs in the market. Obviously, now is, is a trickier time. But I'd like to go all the way back to the beginning of your career, if you don't mind, and sort of share with us how you got into real estate. Uh, definitely a long road. And that's one thing I really love about real estate is that everyone has their own story and their own path into, into the industry. Um, for me, it was kind of on the peripheral um, in terms of the fact that my mother was a Chicago public schools teacher and she actually got her real estate license um, and she had zero interest in selling real estate, but she did it because uh, my aunt was a managing broker at Coldwell Banker in Deerfield and mm -hmm. basically would pay my mother just to have uh, open houses at a couple developer model units uh, in the summer. And so I remember my mother doing open houses on a Saturday or Sunday. And that's all she did was, you know, sit these open houses for the developer at these, you know, model homes. And uh, oftentimes that left me in the backyard of a model home <laughs> playing for two, two hours while, while my mother was inside working, you know. Um, so that, that kind of put it on my radar, um, but never really had any strong interest in it until college. Um, I was getting my degree in entrepreneurship and uh, I had a professor who, who um, said something that really resonated with me. He said, Hey, uh, half of you guys are going to go in business are going to go into sales of some sort. So he said, you know, if you're going to sell something, sell something really expensive. Um, <laughs> you know, he had said, if you sell mattresses, you need to sell thousands of mattresses in order to make a lot of money. Yeah. Um, so that really hit home. And, uh, you know, the same professor had, uh, you know, during an aside said to me, you know, you have a really good personality um, in terms of connecting with people. I think that, you know, um, real estate might be a good industry for you. And it kind of was just a, a light bulb that was like, hey, you know, yeah, that, that, that does sound interesting. Um, you know, so that was my senior year of college. I was 21 years old. So I went and got my license while still going to uh, still get my bachelor's degree. Um, and so I did so down in Champaign and I was amongst many second slash third career people. So a lot of people sure. in my class were, you know, 30, 40, 50 years old getting their license. And they kind of looked at me and were like, what are you doing here? <laughs> um, you know, so I don't know, being a, you know, a 21 year old college kid, I was like, Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to sell real estate. So, sure. um, so fast forward, I, I graduated. Um, and obviously being 21, 22 years old, you don't have a vast network of people looking to buy and sell. So I, I right. took a look, took a look at the industry and said, you know, what else can I do right now? Um, and so that's where I became a leasing agent. So moved up here to Chicago, spent my first two years as a leasing agent, 
uh, a little shout out to Chicago apartment finders back where it all started. Yeah. And, um, you know, being right out of college, I kind of took a uh, college student uh, approach to the industry in terms of, I was like, let me just study, you know, I know school, I know how to study for stuff. And so I started making flashcards of the streets you know, we're on a grid system smart and, and, uh, literally learn, I, I could tell you every street from Cermak down in the South loop all the way up through, you know, Howard, um, up in Rogers park. And I could tell you every street West all the way out to Cicero, um, you know, and I literally just use flashcards and I started learning the neighborhoods, started running all over with, uh, with clients doing rentals, which, you know, is just a, a simplified, you know, um, purchase or sale transaction. So, sure. um, so it really let me get my bearings on what was going on here, here in Chicago. Um, so again, fast forward two years, you know, now I'm, I'm 24, still not ready to jump in full time to sales. Um, so again, I, I didn't want to stay, um, as a rental agent just cause it is easy to get burned out. Um, and so, uh, appraising got on my radar. So I went and got my second license. I became a real estate appraiser and just started going to small appraisal companies saying, who's looking for an appraiser? Um, And that landed me at an appraisal company that had an office in Roscoe Village and one out in in Elmhurst area. Uh, They had about 15 appraisers and uh, the owner of the company um, you know, recognized my ambition and hustle and knowledge of just neighborhoods and whatnot. And, um, said, you know, I went and spent the next five years appraising. Um, so, you know, I was doing everything from condos to, uh, four unit buildings, you know, doing them for banks, uh, attorneys, uh, estate planning, all sorts of different, uh, different things. And so, while I was appraising, um, you know, my network started to grow and I, and I sure. started doing some sales on the side. And, uh, and so at this juncture, I had been appraising for about five years and I was doing about anywhere from two to $4 million in volume, um, moonlighting as an agent while I was working full time as an appraiser. And, wow. uh, yeah. And so I had uh, another shout out. I will give credit to Janine McShay, who's uh, still over at App Properties. At the time, she, she, she said to me, she said, what are you doing? Um, you know, you're <laughs> three to four million in sales on the side, you know. Um, yeah, which, which, and- which is a decent production for even really? a full time. It's not a great production, but it's a decent production for a full time agent. And you were doing it on the side. Totally. And so she said, you know, you really should, should commit. To, to sales. I think that you really have a knack here, um, especially with the appraisal background as well. And uh, so, you know, when I was appraising, I, I was seeing these agents, I'd meet them out for an appraisal. And some of them were, were doing 10, 15 million and uh, no offense to my industry, but some of them just didn't seem super ambitious or together. And I said, you know, I, I can do that. I can yeah. do that. And so, um, you know, I, I left a very, cushy position appraising um, because I had a great business as far as appraisal work goes. Uh, I had more appraisal work than I could handle. Um, and I, I took the scary plunge and became a full-time agent. Um, so that was not great timing because that was in 2009, 2010 yeah. after the crash. Right. Um, but my, my mentality was, Hey, if I can build my business during, the downtime that when the market really rebounded, I would be really set up for success. And so uh, in 2009, December of 2009, I can remember it well, I moved my license over um, and I became my career as a full-time real estate agent uh, and said, you know, hey, it's great to have the appraisal knowledge, but I really want to focus on building my business. And so from 2009 to 2012, I was a sole practitioner. Uh, very end of 2012, I added my first team member, and then it's been a strategic process um, from the end of 2012. Now, here we are, uh, you know, seven and a half, eight years later. Um, there's five of us full time brokers on the team. We are a boutique team, I would say. Um, but, you know, here we are, um, you know, in the, the past two years, we've done 40 plus million each year. And, 
Wow. Uh, you know, obviously we're, we're looking to grow that and, and hopefully we're looking to expand to 50 plus million for the team. Yeah, that's, an, it's an incredible story. And, and so I think so many agents who start out and I say agents only because certain parts of the country still call them agents, or I should just say maybe realtors or whatever, but, but so many, uh, brokers start out doing leasing. Um, however, a very, you probably saw it with, with, with leasing is so few of those leasing agents really make the transition to, to full brokerage. And um, it's kind of a shame because if you're good at leasing, th- there's a chance that you just have to adjust your skill set, learn, learn more. But that same discipline and, 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 and customer service really translates perfectly well. Um, and it's a great way, like you were saying, to just really even learn the geography of the city or, or the community that you serve. Um, you know, you'll learn every apartment building. You'll, you'll, you're just a great way to get introduced to the business. And, and then to add on appraisal on top of that, I imagine um, that gives you, uh, you know, not that you're necessarily competing with other brokers, I'm sure at this point for listings, but if you were to be competing, oh, by the way, I'm a certified appraiser and, and I've, I did that for five years, brings an additional, you know, um, value add to the client, um, which a lot of brokers have never done. So that, that's, that's pretty awesome. Absolutely. You know, I think that um, there's definitely some clients that recognize the, the value of the appraisal license more than others. Um, but I think it's, it's hugely beneficial for working with both buyers and sellers. Um, you know, I'm very data driven in everything that I do um, in terms of pricing out properties, both for buyers and sellers. And I think that this is really attributed to having my appraisal license now at this juncture for 14 going on 15 years um, is that I'm so in tune to, to market data. So when I talk to buyers, I say, Hey, you know, it's just not my experience in the field in terms of selling, but also being able to look at numbers really peg what the, the proper price is, um, you know, for this property, which ultimately helps with negotiations, the same comps or comparables, you know, that I present to my buyers are the same thing that I'm utilizing in terms of negotiations with list agents and sellers, you know, sure. um, on the flip side for the listings, you know, sure. Everyone wants, um, you know, the most money for their property when they're selling, but you know, I tell clients in order to have a successful sale, there's really three parts that they need to hit on. One is getting the property ready. Um, you know, the preparations, the upgrades, the repairs that that's on them. Um, to um, having incredible marketing. And that's where my team, you know, and my brokerage compass come into play. But the third piece is, is pricing. And really, if, if you mess up on any one of these facets, it really does blow the whole deal. So I tell people, hey, you could have just an impeccable place that it looks like you could eat off the floor. And I can come up with just the most incredible marketing collateral via right. virtual tours and brochures and digital ads and all those things of nature. But um, buyers are not stupid. Um, you know, we're, we're in an age where there's so much data out there. So I can't just artificially pull a price out of thin air. You know, yeah. um, I think that it, it needs to be much more methodical in terms of pricing out the property. And, uh, you know, that's something that I talk to my sellers about. Uh, and I think that our, our, our sales have really shown that we do know how to do that well, um, because over the past three years, we are averaging over 98% sales to list price ratio wow. on top of having, you know, under 30 days, days on market for average listing time. So I tell people, hey, you know, it's a team effort, meaning I need them to work with my team as far as getting the place ready and getting uh, marketing collateral in place. But, you know, I'm going to do the research and I'm going to present my case as to why um, I think we need to be listed at a certain spot and positioning in the market. You know, um, for the past few years, you know, as we saw the market rebound from 2013 call it through 2018, I think 2019 kind of leveled off. Um, for the most part, um, I think that you you could be a little bit more aggressive with pricing, but as as pricing gets a little flat, or um, coming out of something like we're dealing with now with COVID, um, I do think that the market is extremely price sensitive in terms of pricing out properties. So, um, in an appreciation uh, appreciating market, you have a little bit more leeway 
in a flat or declining market, I think it is just incredibly important to have that pricing down um, from from the onset, uh, not only to garner a uh, an offer, but also we're, we're seeing appraisal issues kind of peak their ugly head again, which was something that we dealt with quite a bit at the downturn from 08 through 2012. Um, and I think that uh, having a broker that um, can speak to, to pricing and sales prices and um, have the, the data-driven support that we do is a huge advantage because I do find that we are running into less appraisal issues than some of uh, my colleagues that, that I'm talking to in the industry. So I bet there's a lot of listeners right now thinking, oh, what appraisal issues are, are you seeing, obviously, as, as a top producer and somebody who also is an appraiser? Um, can you, do you mind sharing what some of the challenges that, that you're seeing in the industry right now regarding appraisals? Sure. I mean, you know, um, oftentimes sellers say, well, why do I care who, who the lender is? Or, you know, um, they're always looking for that highest price. But the, they have to keep in mind that the bank is lending on that asset based on what the market value is. Sure. So just because uh, so maybe some people got into a bidding war, that does not necessarily mean that the sales data out there um, supports that um, purchase price. So it's really important that like, yes, it's great that for you to go under contract, but you also need to be able to appraise out uh, in order for that buyer to get that loan. Um, so, you know, sometimes it's there, there's uh, a piece of data that's kind of hurting you. Like, obviously everyone knows, like you see a sale and you're like, wait, why'd that sell for so cheap or, or right. why not? So, um, I think it's important to be able to speak to that issue. And, um, one thing that I talk to a lot of my colleagues is about is that um, we should be creating these appraisal packets for the appraisers for when they come through. Uh, too often times I find that uh, some of my colleagues come to me with issues and they're, they're saying, Hey, I ran into this low appraisal and I'm like, well, did you provide comps? Did you talk to them yeah. about why that sale was low? You know, if you have any inside knowledge as to like why that one sale was off or whatnot. So what we are doing is being proactive in terms of creating a whole appraisal packet for the appraiser when they come through. And what we're trying to do is put our best foot forward. And uh, you know, this is something I talked to my team about in terms of being proactive uh, on the front end. So you don't run into issues as opposed to being reactive Hey, sold this place. Uh, appraiser came in, totally undercut me. Now yeah. I have to do a, uh, you know, an appraisal appeal or try to convince that buyer to switch lenders to start start the process over or whatnot. So I tell people, I'm like, hey, yes, there is a process for an appraisal appeal, but the percentage of appraisal appeals very that low. are yeah. very very low. So you know, spending that hour putting together the appraisal packet on the front end could save you hours upon hours of headache on the back end. So really my message to that is just being proactive on the front end. Yeah, that's a huge tip that Lance just gave. And I, I just want to reiterate that because our audience, um, you know, if, if they weren't paying super close attention, they might've missed it, which is what, what Lance and his team do is they actually provide comps and, and data for the appraiser uh, to help them with the appraisal process. And I've heard that advice before. I don't know that anyone's shared it on the show before. So I really appreciate you doing that. And, and it just helps the appraiser do their job better. Um, and some may or may not be all as open uh, to the information right. you're providing, but there's zero downside in saying, here's what we put together. Hopefully this helps you. Um, and you know, you do it sort of with a smile. Um, I imagine when you were an appraiser, um, that was probably uh, if it was uh, agents that you that you trusted and liked and and weren't trying to convince you one way that wasn't you know what you were going to do anyway. Um, I imagine you were really grateful that people would help you put that information together. Absolutely, and I don't think it's just the comps. Um, when we put together the appraisal packet, it's um, you know we're giving them a copy of the executed contract, we're giving them the assessor records, we're giving them a floor plan if it's available. We are giving them the comps with notes um, because a lot of times we do have insight as to some of these sales. I absolutely do call agents um, on the buy side or sell side uh, for insight, so I will include this. Uh, project information for condo associations, who they need to contact. 
Um, my whole thing is, um, you know, when we do an appraisal, it's an indicated range. Yes, we yeah. do have to peg a number, but it's an indicated range. Okay. So if I can um, present a good case as to why our sales price is within range, as well as make their job as easy as possible, um, you know, more times than not, you know, if it is very close, you know, we're going to get the nod again, you know, as, as you mentioned, you know, appraisers need to be completely, you know, objective, you know, in terms of sure. what they're, they're trying to put the information. And so I'm not trying to like bribe them, but sure. just, you know, again, that's my job to make our case as to, you know, where, where we came in. And so that's something that I talk to both sellers the team uh, appraisers, I'm like, Hey, this is, this is the number. Here's how we derived it. And so again, if, if I can make their job a little bit easier, hopefully they can make my job a little bit easier. Yeah. And I wonder what percentage of agents provide any sort of information for the appraiser. I would imagine it's in the single digits. Yeah. Um, yeah. So very that, little, very yeah. little. So, you know, oftentimes when I was an appraiser, it was like pulling teeth, trying to get some information. And I'm like, Hey, you know, I'm, you know, and oftentimes you have to remember that the appraiser is making the least amount of money right. you know, than anyone in the transaction. Right. The loan officers, the attorneys, they're all making more than the appraiser, right? So my thing is like, hey, you know, it is probably an underpaid job, but you know, the reality is that we're just in an in, in, in industry that's not going to pay a thousand dollars for an appraisal. Right. So, you know, hey, if I can make your life a little bit easier, save you a little bit of time, you know, um, if I can give you applicable comparables, who's to say that the appraiser maybe just doesn't miss it when they're looking that, right. that happens. For sure. So, so again, you know, if I can highlight it, you know, if they don't use it cause they think that they found better data that so be it. But right. you know, if I can highlight it and they're like, no, this is good, relevant information. Wh why would they not use it? Yeah. Uh, wow. It's, that's such a great tip. So hopefully everyone listening can start to think about how to, you know, help the appraisal process. And, and this is a great opportunity since we're, most of us in the country are probably restricted in, in our mobility where we're not as out and about. Uh, we're probably still most of us stuck at home. So great opportunity to put, to put together some of this information and start to think about what data could I provide it, to, to these professionals um, to help, you know, this get push through a little faster and, and also maybe help make their job easier, which as you said, hopefully will help make your job easier. Um, so the number one question we get on this show, and I'm so glad I'm bringing, I'm bringing this up only because we, we do a pre-interview process with our guest. Lance was kind enough to give us a, a ton of great information about himself and, and, and what he wanted to discuss. And one of the things he, he was, he's very passionate about is team building. So he built a team starting in 2012. Uh, he now has, has five uh, or maybe six total people, uh, depending on uh, how, how we're counting it. But Lance has, has a good sized team. They do a ton of business. But the number one question we get um, from our listeners is, can you talk more uh, about teams and, and whether individual practitioners should consider joining a team or, or maybe even developing their own team. Uh, my girlfriend's a good example. She's, she's a leasing consultant uh, in-house at a luxury building in, in the West Loop. And she's seen all these brokers come through her building and she's like, I can do that. And um, she absolutely can do it. And so she's now getting her license, uh, just has a leasing license now, but it's getting her broker license and now is trying to figure out should I, meaning her, should she join a team right away or should she go off on her own? Um, and, and she's trying to figure that out too. So not just for new people, but can you talk? Oh, and by the way, also one last thing. We, we just did an interview with, um, we do a monthly episode with theclose.com, uh, which is a great real estate website. They're, they're fantastic. They publish articles. She teaching realtors how to grow their business. But anyway, we do a monthly uh, episode with them. And Chris Linsell, who's one of their senior editors, said 2020 is the year of the team. Um, so this is really apropos of, of, uh, of this conversation. Would love to get your thoughts on, on building a team, um, how that's worked for you, maybe even suggestions you have for agents thinking about doing it and, and how to find the right team if you're looking to join one and maybe why you should create one on your own if, if you're, I know that's, that's a lot to cover, but just your general thoughts on teams are, would be really helpful. Um, I do think that uh, teams are uh, here to stay in terms of you will see uh, the expansion of it, um, just because I think that uh, people have realized that it is all about leverage and by having, sure. uh, by working together with 
with um, other brokers, they can leverage their skills to create more business. So I do think that it's a trend that you're going to continue to see. Um, my overall opinion is that, um, like uh, a lot of the other realtors, there are good teams and there are bad teams. Um, sure. I, won't, I won't call anyone out. Um, but, you know, I think that it, it all really, it does come down to um, – what you're looking for. Uh, yeah. there, there's a couple different motivations for why people build teams. I think sometimes they're uh, improper motivations. You know, I think that right. some people are like, Hey, we're going to build this team and, and we're, I'm going to make so much money off my team and everything else right. like that, which uh, for me was never really a factor in terms of, uh, okay, Hey, I'm going to make money off my team members. Um, because the reality is I think that I, I give more than I take in terms of uh, with the team. So, you know, there, there was no guideline, no um, blueprint necessarily, right. especially, you know, years ago. Now I think that there's more good examples to kind of follow along with in terms of how people have built out to the, their teams. Um, and I was part of that. Uh, my, my first team member, um, I will give her the shout out, Laura Dewey Lando, uh, who <laughs> just so happens uh, knows DJ well. Um, Very well. I, I, let me pause you for a second. Not only yeah. do I know her well, she's her family, uh, her parents and my parents are, are basically best friends. Uh, they are essentially best friends. Um, my dad golfs with her dad uh, at least once or twice a week and has been doing that for 30 plus years. We grew up across the street from each other. So this is a really just funny kind of coincidence because we've been wanting Lance on the show since, since we started this. Laura has always been on his team. Um, but um, it's funny because there are 44,000 agents in Chicago and I grew Grew up uh, across the street in central Illinois from one of them, and it just happens to be uh, your uh, your first team member, and still your team, one of your team members. So yeah, so uh, you know, working with Laura was a great example. Um, you know, I was looking to build out a team um, because I was my I felt the wave of my business getting built bigger. And uh, I knew that Laura was looking to get out of leasing. Um, she mm -hmm. was still at Chicago Apartment Finders where I had originally met her and she had been doing that for years upon years. And so I knew she was looking to get into sales full time and my business was built, was growing. And so I, I, I convinced her to come over and I said, Hey, you know, you can help me out a little bit first year. I'll help you get your bearings. And uh, hopefully this is mutually beneficial. The, the reality is that a lot of the work that I had Laura doing, um, she had no interest in, um, you know, I <laughs> sure. had her, you know, um, and, and more power to her, you know, she was, you know, vocal about, Hey, this is not exactly the role that I envisioned for myself, which, you know, I think oftentimes happens, you know, someone sure. wants to build a team, they come across someone who wants to get into real estate and they, they like basically leech on and they say, Hey, yeah. you're on my team now and let's go. Um, it wasn't a great fit at first, you know? And so, what I found was what I really needed um, help with was I needed an administrative assistant. Um, and so after that first year, what we did was we transitioned Laura into a co-list position. So she works yeah. on, uh, on all my listings with me, which, you know, fast forward seven and a half, eight years later, she's yeah. still helping with. So that was obviously the right move. And then I hired a uh, administrative assistant. And so um, you know, one of the things I will, you know, strongly advocate is for people who are going to build out a team, kind of really define what you need. Okay. Yeah. Um, what, it, what is your need? Like, what do you not like doing or what do you not have time doing and finding that person that fits that need as opposed to just finding a person first and then saying, okay, here's what I need you to do, you All know? Right. Um, so for me, uh, I realized I had to become much more methodical in terms of, dictating what my expectations were, what I needed um, from that person. And for each person that has joined my team, it's been for a very specific role. Um, I have, um, as I mentioned, I have Laura who co-lists with me. Um, Nancy Gordon is, is my buyer's agent. Um, I have uh, Joanna Balberin or Joanne Balberin, who is my director of operations. She's an amazing assistant slash director of operations. Um, and then we added Christina too who uh, handles all the rentals and uh, now she is actually starting to um, pick up with some of the uh, auxiliary uh, listings and buyers that we have. But everyone's had a very specific role. And so I found that I'm having much more success with the team in terms of um, being very clear with what my expectations for them are, 
um, what I can help them with, you know, so that um, we can figure out a way to make it mutually beneficial. Uh, I think that too many times uh, team members or team leaders just think that they're going to throw this team member on the team and they're going to grow it and it's going to be great and not really realizing that what some of the growing pains are um, and really kind of taking time and dedicating it to them in terms of, okay, what can I help you with? What problems are, are you experiencing? You know, um, with, with our team meetings, um, it is easy to get off track. So I definitely come in with an agenda for the meeting and we run through everything that we need to talk to that I have. And then it's kind of open to the floor and saying, okay, what else, what do you need me for? Um, what can I help you with? And, uh, you know, everyone on my team knows that they have uh, direct access to me. I mean, I, I talk to all of them pretty much on a, on a daily basis. We, um, when the offices are, uh, are open, which we are hoping will open again, we, um, we very much are a team that's in the office quite a bit. Um, I know a lot of uh, realtors work out of their home, which sure, I, I, I'm speaking to you from my house right now, and I work out of my house quite a bit too, but um, I would say in quote unquote normal times, you will find me in the office minimum four days a week, uh, oftentimes five days a week, uh, but always available to my team literally seven days a week um, as they're working with buyers and sellers of their own um, outside of just working on, on the deals that, that I assign them to as well. So I think that, you know, long story short, um, my number one recommendation would be to make sure that they, uh, if, if you're a broker looking to build out a team, make sure that you know exactly what you're looking for and you're very clear in what you are looking for when you are hiring people. If you are on the other side and you're looking to get into the industry, I think it's an excellent opportunity um, to learn from someone. But I also would warn people from just joining a team because they found someone who's willing to take them on. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of a, not, not kind of, it definitely is a pain to change brokerages. Sure. So I think that, you know, really doing your homework and making sure it's a good fit up front um, is really crucial in order to have long-term success. And uh, fortunately, I think that we are doing things the right way. You know, as I mentioned, Laura's been on the team this, you know, later this year will be eight years for her. Um, my, my previous uh, assistant, Mary, was with me for five years before she moved over to California. Um, not that she was looking to leave me in the team, but, you know, life circumstances yeah. took her to sure. the West Coast. But uh, Nancy, my buyer's agent, is, is going uh, later this year. It will be five years for her on the team. Wow. So fortunately, um, you know, I, I'm finding people who um, like how we integrate things, like working with me and the rest of the team and uh, have stuck with me because I think that is definitely something that you see quite a bit with teams just having team members or assistants come and go and just kind of a revolving process. And um, that that's just something that I was very adamant that I did not want to see for, for me or my business. I, I like consistency. Um, I don't love change. Yeah, me so, too. <laughs> um, you know, I definitely appreciate when I've been able to find someone who's like committed and I feel is a good fit for the team and, and be able to, uh, to run with it. Yeah. And I think now um, that was all very well said. And I think now is a kind of a unique opportunity. Uh, if somebody is, is uh, if our listeners are thinking, well, maybe I'd be a good fit for, for someone's team is to, you know, really now start to have those conversations with other teams and, and you're interviewing them as much as they're interviewing you and a great, op a great way to really sit down and, and write out, here are my strengths. Here's what I can offer a team. Here's where I think I could fit in. And then start, you know, start interviewing teams. You know, everyone's doing Zoom meetings now anyway. What a great opportunity to reach out um, and just say, hey, I'm, I'm thinking about joining a team. You seem like you might be a good fit. Here's what I can offer. Can we schedule a, a quick phone call? Um, and Lance's team is, is not currently taking on new, eight, you know, they, they're, they're at capacity right now. Um, but lots of teams are, uh, are looking. So this is a great opportunity just to, you know, now that we're all maybe just a little bit slower, although I'm sure Lance and his team aren't, aren't any slower, but a lot of agents listening maybe are right now. So this is a great opportunity just to see what teams are out there and, and really come to the team with, a proposal of sorts, like, here's what I can do. And here's where I'm strong. Um, and here's where I can add value. And um, I would say that's probably a, a, the best, the best chance. And, and remember too, that team owners are, are, 
our, our team leaders are business owners. I mean, you're everyone who is a real estate agent is probably their own business as well, but team leaders are running a business and, you know, give them a proposal, say, here's what I'm thinking. Um, and, and see if it's a good fit. And, um, but yeah, I think the advice is, is very, very strong, which is to say, you know, don't just join a team cause they'll accept you or that, you know, you feel that it might be a good fit, like really sit and hammer out the details of what am I going to do for you? Uh, what are you going to do for me? Um, how is this going to mutually benefit, uh, each other? So great, Absolutely. great advice there. Yeah. Um, I, you know, and, and I love talking to other team leaders cause I don't have all the answers. Um, I think sure. that for, for me, after being in the business so long, you know, um, I, I know a lot of people in, in the industry. And so absolutely, I try to get together um, with t other team leaders to kind of find out what they're doing. Because, you know, again, I don't have all the answers. You know, I'm, I'm trying to figure things out just as much as everyone else is as I grow my team. And so, um, you know, I'm always looking for best practices from, from other individuals. And, uh, you know, all I can speak of is, is what's worked for us thus far, but you know, we are sure. always evolving and every year, um, you know, we kind of take a look at the business and say, what can we improve on? That's usually in that fall slash winter, um, because that's right after our busy season, obviously the whole situation now put a little crimp in the spring selling season, but that's absolutely, um, some of what I've been doing over the past, you know, month, month and a half is trying to not only also figure out what's going to happen the rest of this year and, and plan for future business, but also kind of work on some of the things that we wouldn't have normally had a chance to work on during the spring. Can I ask you uh, now that, that, you know, things are, um, have shifted obviously with the market, obviously with the global, um, you know, the sort of the global economy, as well as just people's ability to, to move about um, as, as a successful team and, and a successful agent yourself. Um, can do you mind sharing with our listeners sort of what you're doing uh, to keep the business, you know, growing and, and or at least maintaining it um, during this time where you're, you're restricted in some of your activities? What, and just any advice you have for the listeners about what they could do during this time as well? Um, well, one thing I would say is try to keep doing what you have been doing as well. You know, like a lot of people have kind of just hit pause. Um, I have talked to some brokers that have literally been sitting home for the past two months, kind of doing nothing, um, yeah. which I think is, a, a you know, great if that's what you want to do and recharge your batteries. So be it. That's your, your prerogative. Um, you know, I would definitely say that the first couple of weeks were a little bit slower for me also trying to figure out what's yeah. going on, what's the new norm. Sure. But, you know, after a couple of weeks, I mean, I'm used to go, 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 go. Yeah. So I said, yeah. all right, what can we, what can we continue to work on? And so we've been, we've been pivoting to certain things, but also, you know, still doing a lot of what we do. And when I say that, I mean, um, you know, we have our team meetings once a week. Uh, no, we cannot meet in person, but we have it on the same day at the same time. And so we have our Zoom meeting with my entire team because I want to keep that routine so that once we do open up, you know, it's not like, hey, we have to get back into this routine. It's like, no, right. we, we meet as a team on Tuesdays from 11 to 1. Like, that's how it, it always is. Um, also, you know, continuing with our, our marketing plan, I am continually still doing our social media posts. Um, I'm still sending out, uh, at least one to two postcards a month. You know, I'm continuing on with, um, the things that I had put in play earlier in terms of how I wanted to continue with my market. But then, um, also obviously I'm spending less time in the field. And so I just, I took, for me personally, I took the opportunity to really kind of reach out and talk to my sphere and, and not about real estate, just, right. um, you know, fortunately uh, most of my business is built on referral. So I have some just like absolutely amazing, amazing clients that I think are just like way smarter than me and incredibly intelligent people. And so um, I do enjoy just connecting with these people and, and seeing how, how they've been dealing with everything. How has their work life um, been sure. affected as far as like, Hey, you know, like how is your company adapting? Like what are best practices that you guys have been doing? And, you know, I will be honest and that not everyone wants to talk right now. Some people are like doom and gloom and like, Hey, so that's okay. I'm not personally offended if they don't take my call or call me back, sure. but the people who do pick up the people who do call back, like I'm having some just like incredible, meaningful conversations with clients and 
I will say that uh, coming out of the stay at home order, we, um, I've picked up a lot of clients the past couple of weeks, uh, both buy, sell, everything. Um, and so who knows what exactly how 2020 will end up just because we are kind of in the, in the evolving situation. But I will tell you that we are already planning for 2021. Um, I have, you know, I would say between 30 to 40 transactions lined up for 2020, 2021, wow. um, just knowing, you know, what people, when they're going to be moving, you know, kind of moving on with their lives. So um, again, you know, it, it has to be an authentic conversation. I am not yeah. calling for business. I am just like legitimately calling to connect with people, but you know, it's just another one of those like quote unquote touches, you know, it's just another opportunity to reach out to people and be like, Hey, how are you guys doing? You know? Exactly. Yeah. Um, so, you know, again, it, if you call people and you're like, Hey, are you, are you squished? Are you thinking about moving? You know, yeah. pe people don't want to be sold, you know, but, <laughs> right. and I'm, and I'm never about that because what I tell people is I've been doing this for so many years. I don't care if you are moving this year or next year. What I care about is that like you, that we stay in touch. And if in five years you decide it's time to upgrade that, Hey, I've been talking to you for five, six years, you know, I'm going to be the first person that you reach out to. So, um, you know, it's just kind of, again, just being in touch with people. And, um, you know, fortunately I'm, I'm in a position where I really like 85 to 95% of my clients, <laughs> you know? Um, yeah. so it's, it's not a painful thing for me to, to be reaching out and to have a conversation and be like, Hey, how's life? How are things on your end? I was, um, just doing a survey for Walgreens before we started. They sent me, I'm one of those morons that when they say do a survey, I do it even though, you know, there's no benefit directly to me. I'm like, oh, I'll help out Walgreens. And so I'm, sure. I'm, doing, I'm doing a survey. And one of the questions though, it, it, it got me, uh, you just triggered the, this memory. Um, it, one of the questions was very interesting it's, and, and it really didn't seem to have anything to do specifically with Walgreens, but they said, do you feel more connected to your friends and family uh, since the beginning of the of the pandemic, or has it stayed the same, or has it gotten worse? And obviously, there's a lot of lonely people out there, and I'm just talking about my experience. But um, I actually I thought about it for a second because I was like, oh, that's an interesting question. And I went, you know, I actually feel more connected to my friends and family because we're having more of those conversations. However, I was also and I and I've shared the second part of what I'm about to share before, so I apologize to the listeners who have already heard it, but. Um, I started thinking about, so my friends and family, we're all really well connected. And I think a lot of us can, can say that that's happened as a result of, unfortunately, uh, what's happening in the world right now. However, um, where I have not got a lot of communication and connection are from the professional service uh, people in my life, the people I pay fees to, who I consider part of you know, like my account, and I'm not in any way criticizing anyone who, who I pay service fees to and who, you know, I, I like them all and I don't expect them to call me, but I have not received phone calls from my accountant or, or my financial advisor or, you know, um, an attorney or, or anyone, you know, anyone who, who's in that sphere. And I'm not criticizing them for doing it, but I just see what a great opportunity for you as in, for our listeners and, and for anyone who's an agent or anyone in any sales capacity, just to reach out and say, how are you, the only, how are you doing? The only person that reached out to me, this is funny, but true, is the person that cuts my hair. She said, how are you doing? I, I, I'm thinking about you. And, and it's a legitimate, um, you know, she can't cut my hair now anyway, but she goes, just wanted to let you know, I was thinking about you sent me a text. We've went back and forth a little bit. How's, you know, how are you doing? How's your girlfriend? How's, you know, how, and I'm asking her about her family. And I, and as silly as that sounds, um, it meant a lot to me that, you know, there was no business to be had. She just was right. reaching out and you were doing the same thing. And I think, um, what a great opportunity. It's not like, the majority of us are getting a lot of calls like that, except from maybe friends and family. So great opportunity to, as, as Lance said, deepen those connections, deepen those relationships and just check in and see how people are doing. Yeah, totally. It's, it's, you know, again, it's not because I expect those people who I'm calling to be buyer and buying sure. or selling. I just want them to know that I like genuinely care so that, you know, ultimately if they do know someone who is buying or selling, even if it's not them, down the line or whatnot, they're like, Hey, this is a person that like actually cares. Um, on top of, you know, my clients do know that I know what I'm talking about and know what I'm yeah. doing. So why not? Like it makes it, it makes it such an easy referral 
to refer someone who a, you know, is good. And then B you actually like, you know, um, or think is like a caring person. So, you know, to me, it's, it's not about the cell. It's about the connection. And, um, you know, fortunately I have a great network that's really, um, treated me very, very well over the years. And so I'm very thankful for that. Uh, yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, I would love to, as we're, we're wrapping up, I would love for you to share, because this is such an interesting story, um, and, and I've never heard a story exactly quite like it. Do you mind sharing the experience you had selling a church? Um, this is just such a great story. I think our listeners would, would love to hear it. Sure. These clients, um, they, they found me online, and, and I love them to death. They, um, they they're, you know, definitely have some very unique um, it just appeal the properties. And so, you know, we started looking at some houses and they were just like, nothing clicked, you know? And, um, I ended up working with them for quite some time. And the three properties that they really thought about, um, deeply about buying were one, um, was an old speakeasy in, uh, in Wicker <laughs> park that had been converted to a two flat. Um, the second one was uh, on the border of, uh, we'll call it like River West, West Loop. And it was an old um, manufacturing building that someone had illegally converted to a single family. <laughs> that was like just incredible. And the third one, the one that they actually bought was uh, an 1860s Ukrainian church over in Humboldt Park. Um wow. And the building itself was absolutely incredible. And when I say it was a church house that I'm saying that, you know, very liberally, because what had happened was a a professor from um, the art Institute purchased the church from, um, you know, as an actual church and uh, her and her husband at the time uh, went through the city and had it rezoned as a single family home. Mm. Subsequently, during that process, unfortunately, she uh, went through a divorce and so became a uh, single income. So at that juncture, she now had this church, which she really didn't necessarily have the funds to renovate anymore. So she took this church and basically made it into a zero bedroom, one bathroom church that she just lived in for the next 17 to 18 years. Wow. And um, she lived there. And when we bought it, um, she had she had a partner who um, she had met and uh, he had been living there for five to seven years or something. And they decided that, they, that she was retiring. She was retiring from the Art Institute. And so she wanted a farm. So she was selling the church and buying a farm up in Wisconsin. Okay. Um, so that's where my clients came in. And, um, I mean, this thing was very much just a straight up church. I mean, 45 foot ceilings from the middle, you know, from the floor to the ceiling, you know, had, had the only thing with that you could tell that wasn't church was they pulled the pews. So, I mean, still had the balcony, everything else like that. Wow. Yeah. Just a really incredible place. Um, my clients, um, you know, they broke it down into like three phases Um, since we closed on it, which gosh, was probably about eight years ago. Now, um, they've built a a garage with a roof deck. Um, they actually built out two bedrooms. So (laughs) actual actual bedrooms. Um, and, uh, she was, the professor was actually heating the church with wood pellet, uh, fireplaces, uh, when, when we purchased the property. So they, my clients have gone in and actually outfitted it with, uh, with furnaces and ACs. So it is function a little bit more like a single fam. But uh, I mean, to this day, I mean, my clients have said they've gotten a couple knocks on the door because people think it's still a church, um, yeah. you know, and um, I, I, I won't give out the exact address, but sure. for those people who know Humboldt Park, if they go over um, down, uh, down Rockwell, they will see, this church uh, on the Northeast corner. We'll say it's on Rockwell on the Northeast corner, <laughs> if you can find it. And you, it very much still looks like an 1860s church. And it is just, I, I mean, I, I love it. I'll, I'll uh, always yeah. love it. That is so cool. So the, the previous owner and, and her partner, they were, they were just like the, like the world's largest studio, basically. Yes. Yep. They just, I mean, they had a bed set up in the corner and, wow. uh, it was, it was unreal. Um, it, but you know, one of the coolest properties, um, my clients have done some amazing things. 
Um, you know, my clients are, are fortunate enough to, they have a house down in Key West. They have a, a, another property out in Arizona. Um, so hopefully one day um, when they do sell it, I will get to list it again. And uh, they've just done some incredible stuff. But I mean, you know, um, my ultimate goal is one day to convert a firehouse into a single family. So, you know, oh. um, you know, I have aspirations just like them. <laughs> that's great. Oh, what a cool story. Uh, well, um, I think that's a great place to wrap up is, uh, you know, um, Lance is, is and his team have, have done incredible things. And we should also re-mention, we, we, met, we mentioned it at the very beginning, but it was easy to lose is Lance was, was named and we have again, 44,000 brokers in Chicago. That's it's a huge number. And he was literally the MVP uh, by Chicago Agent Magazine, which is the premier publication uh, to give out those kind of awards in Chicago. And so he was literally the guy last year. So um, we're super honored uh, to Lance to have had you on the show. Oh, we should also mention that for anyone who's listening, who's a buyer, a seller, a renter, an investor, uh, who might be looking to work with somebody who's an MVP and also has a great, a great group, a great team who knows their stuff and obviously cares. Uh, what's the best way that someone who wants to work with you or your team should be reaching out? Probably the easiest way they can just go to my website, which is lancek.com. Um, you know, and they can find all my contact information. Also, if you just Google my name, I will pop up on almost every real estate website you can find. Um, so feel free to reach out and, uh, you know, would love to work with some of your listeners. Yeah. So everyone, again, visit Lance uh, at his website, Lance, that, and then the letter K, LanceK.com. And also please follow Lance and his group at on Instagram, which is at Broker Lance. Uh, well, Lance, um, on behalf of the listeners, we thank you uh, for taking the time to be on our, our show. We really couldn't appreciate it more. Um, like I said, you were somebody on our, we made a list of, uh, this is true, we made a list of, uh, of t uh, the, the people we wanted the most and you, you were right at the top of that list. And so it, it took some time, um, which, which we understand and we're so appreciative that you were able to, to find the time to do this. And also on behalf of Lance and myself, we want to thank the listeners for also continuing to support this show. We ask before we go for everyone who's listening to do just qu two quick things. One is tell a friend. Um, you've obviously listened to this great interview with Lance. He's given a tremendous amount of value to help you in your own business. Please share this with somebody that could hear, that could benefit from having heard this. So you can send uh, anyone that you can think of, a real estate professional, right over to our website, which is keepingitrealpod.com. We have every episode we've ever done. We even just rebuilt the website and we have everything organized into shows. So if you're a fan of some of our other features, uh, you can actually go straight to those and listen to all those particular episodes. Uh, the second thing we'd like you to do is to follow us on Facebook. Please find us facebook.com forward slash keeping it real pod or just search for Keeping It Real Podcast, we should pop right up. Uh, because we do two things on there. Every day we find an article online that's written by someone that, that's designed specifically to help you grow your business as a real estate professional. The second thing is we post all, all of our episodes there too. And, and we even post live recordings. So if you're listening to this right now, we actually already broadcast it on our Facebook uh, page in real time. So you don't have to wait for us to produce these, uh, the, these uh, episodes. So please follow us again on Facebook. Um, and we would appreciate it. Lance, thank you so much. Um, we're excited to continue to see uh, your, your, the trajectory of, of your group and, and um, how you guys have, have really taken over Chicago and, and are going to continue to do so. So thank you. Uh, thanks so much. Thanks for having me.